Hi everyone, my name is Joris Peels, and today we're going to be talking about 3D printing metals, logic gates, and mobile robot computers. Uh, so, what are we talking about first? Well, first, uh, there's some really amazing research going on um, from MIT. It's a simple semiconductor logic gate. So what does that mean? Uh, so what they've done is they've used a copper doped or uh, uh, part that's made with polycaprolactone. Polycaprolactone is a biodegradable, even bioabsorbable uh, polymer with some really, really, really remarkable uh, properties. Uh, the elongation is over 5,000%. You can heat set it. Uh, it's really, really amazing stuff. And what they've managed to make is kind of like a, an alternative to a logic gate. Um, usually these kind of semiconductor type things are made with lots and lots of uh, different processes all working together. They're often using a lot of solvents, really nasty materials. They work at volume really well. So if you want 10 million or a billion or something, that's absolutely fantastic. And this process probably won't compete with that, but might um, work with some kind of more lower volume uh, um, electronics. So I've been talking about 3D printed MEMS where you're saying, hey, we can't do the volume of MEMS and maybe our MEMS will be more uh, expensive, but we could make a thousand of them just for a really specialized kind of thing. So something like that could be uh, used in a sense. Um, this could also be a much more sustainable thing. It could be much easier to recycle because it doesn't use like 10 different thermosets and all these processes and stuff. It just uses some two materials and so you can melt away the, the polycaprolactin very easily and then reuse the copper. Um, you could maybe think of this as being kind of a, a way to get austere electronics. So electronic, electronics made in very austere environments, like a military base in the front or uh, perhaps a developing country. Um, you could just say, uh, you know, maybe have a kind of more closed loop electronic kind of development where you're looking at things that are maybe very disposable, electronics that are kind of uh, used up or maybe almost consumables ever since like the disposable camera. We've got more and more electronics that are basically kind of like thrown away in very low cost. Uh, so that could be a, a real uh, alternative there. So I think it's a beautiful thing, uh, and uh, I think it's really, really nice research. And it also points to a lot of other people thinking about this, saying, hey, can we make more sustainable electronics or make electronics much more accessible uh, to many more market parties, including maybe even individuals at home? The next thing is MobiPrint. It's essentially it's a mobile 3D printer. And it's fun. I think it's fun. And we, we, we haven't had a lot of fun research in 3D printing. And this is, uh, there's a paper on it, MobiPrint, a mobile 3D printer for environment, scale, design, and fabrication. Uh, it's done by Daniel Cap uh, Camposamora uh, and uh, Liang He. They're at the University of Washington, or at least they were, Liang He is somewhere else. And MobiPrint is essentially it's a Prusa mounted on top of a vacuum robot. So I, what I love about this is, okay, first off, it's fun. Secondly, it's very doable and it makes it, uh, it kind of acts upon existing resources that we have in the world, like these robot vacuums that have gotten a lot, lot cheaper later. What it does is it scans the room with LiDAR and then goes around and prints stuff in the room on the floor. Now, for the moment, it's a bit kind of a design exploration, kind of an idea exploration kind of thing. But imagine something that would restore a house by itself or put little things in place uh, by itself in upgrading the home or upgrading a certain outdoor area, uh, printing things somewhere. Um, think of like something like that would print planters somewhere or uh, uh, protection for flood protection, right? This little robot just goes and does it sing. Uh, six months later, you come back and, and collect the robot. So it's a very different thing of a way of thinking about autonomy. We're not talking about like a drone that does a mission. We're talking about something that was like, you know, builds a flood defense over the cost of eight months without anybody having to be there. And this is the kind of thing I think it would really inspire a lot of people. And it looks a little bit silly at first. You're like, wait, you put a LiDAR thing and then you put a Prusa on a you know, vacuum robot. But if you think about this in a different way, if you think about this as like uh, making uh, more sustainable architect, uh, architecture or making more sustainable kind of agriculture stuff or making sustainable infrastructure, these kind of things can be very different. And it's not like a project with like 10 guys there. No, no, it's like something that is ongoing. Somebody building your flood defense all the time or somebody building uh, some erosion protection in the desert. And you just drop 100 of these robots there and you collect them every six months for maintenance. So I think this kind of thing is really, uh, uh, yeah, really kind of really, really very, very cool. Uh, the next thing is also very cool. There's two, uh, a sergeant, staff sergeant, Nicholas Brevin, uh, and Sergeant London Borday, uh, Landon Borday, sorry, excuse me. Uh, and they are both machinists and, and technicians, and they have just gotten the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, which proves that now we can 3D print medals, which is a very, very significant thing in uh, the Navy and other armed forces. 
What happened is they have a Marine Aviation Logistics Squadron 13. That's where they work. And they support, I think, four squadrons of F-35 uh, 2B, some of the most advanced aircraft in the world. And in July, uh, they had problems with reamers. Reamers like a kind of tool that you can use to do corrosion detection and removal, let's say. Um, and it's a really fairly simple tool. These things are made out of Torlon, quite an abrasive uh, material. And the idea was that it's just abrasive enough to remove the corrosion, just abrasive enough to go in everywhere, but not abrasive enough to mess up uh, the actual uh, airframe which you wanted to protect, obviously. Now, these things cost 30 bucks. This is not something we usually think of 3D printing. But the problem is that they were just not available. And these guys, it was causing these guys delays. Um, so what they then did is they used the Mark IV's X7 and chop fiber, uh, carbon fiber um, uh, material they have, but they didn't tell us which one, uh, to make a replacement. So that's great, right? They have them available. This is the example we always hear. But these guys went much further, and that is something I think is, it makes this a really, really stellar example. They actually redesigned the tool to increase the lifespan by 300%. So now these things, first off, they're much cheaper. They last a lot longer. But also in, a, in the context of these Marine, these Air Force guys, they have to bring a lot less of them with them if they're on an aircraft carrier or if they're all in some base in a foreign country. So this makes it a ton cheaper. You have no idea how expensive it is to get all the stuff there. So you're getting less stuff over there, if you will, is a huge savings. But there's another thing. The maintenance cost was reduced significantly uh, and they were made just on the day uh, uh, in the location. Now, I like this idea of designing for maintenance. An idea is saying, like, you know what? We can actually reduce the time the Marine or the Air Force technician uses in using this thing, right? We can actually kind of improve this thing and make it so that these guys spend less time and, and, they, and they have to wait less time. So I think these kind of things, a lot of people are focused on part costs. Like, oh, it's more expensive, less expensive. Well, that's fine. But if I have a more expensive part that reduces my guy's time for an hour to 15 minutes, that, that more expensive part is going to pay for itself really very, very quickly. So I love this kind of thinking, this engineering for maintenance kind of thinking, uh, this idea of, of, of trying to speed up people. And, and I like the fact that it's like a $30 part. It's not the type of part we usually think of, uh, of replacing. So I think this is really wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great example. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. This is another 3D printing news unpeeled. My name is Joris Peels and have a great day.